Hello everyone, my name is Pixwarifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you guys are having a good day. There's a chicken. <laughs> we are here in the nether because I figured I would start somewhere a little bit different. And today I wanted to start off by giving you guys a tip that was shared with me in the comments section of the last video where we put together this bartering haul. I want to say a big thanks to Dylan for suggesting this in the comments. This is a really, really cool tip actually. Dylan pointed out that minecart chests are actually now a really good way of storing items in the nether. You will need a rail to put them down on, of course, but you can break the rail and the chest will stay there. It will still be able to be pushed around a little bit, so you might want to find a secure place to put it. But because minecart chests do not have an opening and closing animation, you can access their inventories and even break them without the piglins here getting mad at you. You'll see I've opened it up to the two Bartholomews here so that you guys can see these two are able to see me. They have full line of sight, but if I put down a chest minecart in front of these guys, if the chicken isn't getting in the way at least, I can open and close that without any concerns about them getting aggro. Whereas if I open up this chest, they immediately start firing at me, or at least that one does because he has a crossbow. The other one over here raises his sword as though he wants to attack me. But once again, the minecart chest does not trigger that reaction. So that actually makes minecart chests probably the biggest inventory that you can safely open with piglins around without them getting angry at you. And I am back to wearing a gold helmet, as you saw in the introduction. I got myself another gold helmet after I lost mine in the previous episode. Got a new shield all set up and we are good to go. Respawn anchors, they're a menace. <laughs> Don't trust them. But for now, we are over here in the piglin bartering hall because I want to grab myself one of these books, a Soul Speed 3 book, because today we're going to be taking a look at transport in the nether and how it has changed in the 1.16 update in the nether update specifically i want to look at three things i want to look at soul speed i want to look at lodestone compasses and i want to look at striders whoa and it looks like we had a bit of a zombie siege overnight <laughs> these guys all showed up out of nowhere the minute i got out of my bed here and i had no idea they were just around the corner but i expect a lot of them might have been going for my trading hall and that is not something you see every day but zombie sieges are a thing that's been in minecraft for a while it was not a super likely that they would happen for a long time i think they may even have been like disabled by a bug or something like that but they are now back in the game in a big way as of i think 1.15 i've never really caught one on camera to give you guys the opportunity to check it out but yeah overnight occasionally zombie sieges can spawn in areas that have high concentrations of villagers and it's a very good thing that that one spawned outside of my trading hall and not on the inside because otherwise these iron golems might have had their work cut out for them but it looks like they're all fine that guy there needs a little bit of repair let's see if i can mend him up a little bit using the iron ingot i've got on me there we go right as rain <laughs> anyway what i'm actually back here for is to use this anvil so that we can apply soul speed to oh too expensive are you kidding me i can't apply them to my fancy netherite boots what a shame. Okay, well, we'll have to create another set of soul speed boots then instead. Or maybe, just maybe, we can create another set of boots that I will need to use later. I am wondering if soul speed and frostwalker are mutually exclusive. Never mind, that's too expensive as well. Apparently, soul speed 3 is actually quite an expensive enchantment to apply to gear. That is something I'm learning today. All right, let's see if we can grab anything else. I might have some more boots up here, and we can see how much... It costs to enchant something. Yeah, something around this region. Let's have a go with that. So this is a set of boots that I must have got from an end city loot chest because I do not recall having crafted these at any point. And that is 12 levels of enchantment cost. So that's not terrible. I think if we add some feather falling to this, they could be viable. And then we can add some netherite to them after the fact, maybe. Hmm, okay, let's let's give that a try. Now, we have a set of Soul Speed Diamond Boots. I do have a spare Frostwalker 2 book in here, so let's see if those are... No, they are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so you can have Soul Speed and Frostwalker on your boots. I guess that makes sense, though, because Soul Sand and Water are not exactly mutually exclusive themselves, so you'll probably find them both in the same place, and I wonder what would happen if you ran on ice with Soul Sand underneath. It might slow you down, it might speed you up, I'm not certain. Let's see if we can find a feather falling book though there we go we can add feather falling to those only five levels that time and let's see if we can get depth strider from somewhere in here as well i think i saw it yep there we go that one's still got projectile protection on but that shouldn't carry over there we go only 10 emeralds not 10 emeralds 10 enchantment levels that time gets us a pretty good set of boots and i guess we'll probably end up upgrading these 
to netherite as well. Back down to the netherite mine we go, where I have been collecting some of my netherite into blocks. I guess I'll smelt up three more of these ancient debris. We smelt up some of that nether gold ore as well, because nether gold ore can be broken down into nuggets with fortune, but can also be smelted as ingots. And that right there gets us an ingot of netherite, which we can now apply to our brand new boots. For no cost whatsoever, we get six enchantments on the boots. Very, very nice. And I think these might end up being my new fancy boots. Those can go back in the chest next to the Frostwalker boots. We'll pop them in there. And now we are primed and ready to take on the Soul Sand Valleys. Because soul sand has historically been a bit of a tricky substance to get around in the nether. It slows you down by walking on it. And while this new soul soil block is obviously a little bit more easy to walk around on, if I take these boots off for a second, you will see. There we go. If I walk on soul sand for a little bit, yeah, that is slowing me down quite tremendously without any boots on. And we need to do something about that. Enter the brand new soul speed enchantment. Now we have this equipped to our feet you will see that I am walking around a little bit faster. In fact, it's a little bit like driving a race car when you end up sprinting with this stuff. Soul Speed is a brand new enchantment that allows you to travel even faster, although you don't seem to retain your momentum as much when you jump, so it can be a little bit disorienting at first. What you will see behind me as I run is that occasionally a few of the souls escape in this kind of blue animation that you see behind there, and that means the durability on these boots is actually decreasing. Soul speed comes with a price, and that is at the cost of some durability. Having said that, of course, with mending on these boots and with a netherite level durability, you're probably going to find that they last a little while. But beware of putting soul speed on some boots like this that you desperately need to keep around, because chances are you won't be able to keep them around for as long as you think. Anyway, traveling around soul sand valleys is going to be much, much faster. And not only that, but we can, of course, move some of the soul sand or soul soil into an area where it's possible to sprint between biomes and use this for a kind of fast travel. So all we need to do is collect up a few of these blocks, and I think I'm going to stick with the soul soil for now, because if I get caught without my soul speed boots, at least you still move at normal running pace on that, unlike the soul sand, which is going to slow you down regardless. Another interesting factor about this is it also improves your reversing speed as well as your moving forward speed. You can't exactly sprint in reverse, but it does mean you go a little bit faster, and that could potentially be really useful when it comes to bridging. Let's try that out for a second here. Yeah, it's difficult to judge, but I definitely think I'm bridging a little bit faster here. And of course, when ghasts attack, all I need to do is sprint for the opposite side of the bridge, and you can't even tell where they were firing at because I'm already no longer there. You know what? For traversing the nether, this is potentially going to be my new go-to material. I like this stuff a lot, and having soul speed on the boots that's not going to be too bad either. Very, very cool stuff. Even with the increased speed on soul sand and soul soil, I still don't think this beats the speed at which you can travel using boats and blue ice, but it is still a refreshing change from being slowed down by soul sand to be able to skip over it at the high speeds that we can, collect the bones you want from the soul sand valley, and maybe even create some running paths if you want to traverse the nether that way. It also doesn't seem to run down your hunger nearly as much as sprinting on an ice way does, so I have a feeling this is actually a little bit more economical in terms of your hunger rating, or maybe just the golden carrots are a really good food source. Difficult to say. <laughs> One thing's for sure, all that experimentation has worn a little bit of durability off my boots, but you don't need to worry about soul speed wearing your boots down unless you are running on soul sand or soul soil, so for now that's not something we need to worry too much about. While I'm up here on the netherrack, you'll notice no souls are escaping, none of those blue particles appear, and the durability on my boots has not gone down at all. For our next test, I'm going to take out one of these, the lodestones that I've acquired from Bastions. And these are actually pretty special blocks. They are very, very difficult to get hold of. And as a crafting recipe, it is possible to craft them, but they do require some of the brand new netherite. Let me look that up in here. Yes, you will need one netherite ingot surrounded by chiseled stone bricks to get yourself a lodestone. So those are potentially going to be a little bit expensive, and finding them in bastions, if you are able to, may be an easier way to get hold of them, or at least a less expensive way for the player to get hold of them. And what lodestones do is actually pretty special. It works 
in basically any dimension, if I can find a compass anywhere around here, I think I may have to craft one myself, or of course I think I can buy them from... Uh, is it librarians or is it cartographers? I would expect it to be cartographers, but sometimes they sell stuff instead of buying it. There we go. Get ourselves a couple of compasses, and I'm going to put the lodestone in here, in my storage building. We'll pop it down there in the center, and let's see how we do here. Now, if I right-click on this with a compass... There we go. <laughs> we get we get a very funny name advancement. Country load take me home. There we go. So for a long time in this game, compasses have only ever pointed in one direction. And it's not north and it's not towards the last place you slept. It is towards the spawn point of the world itself. The world spawn point. Point. And as you can see right now, this compass is pointing towards this particular block of endstone here. And as I dance around the endstone, you will see that right there is my world spawn point. This is more or less where I spawned when I first logged into the survival guide world. And up here on the cliff, we have an indestructible end crystal that I brought back from the dragon's respawn sequence. This end crystal ended up down there as well when it came through the end portal back into this world. That right there is the spawn block from which the rest of my world has generated. And compasses will always point to that. Even if you set your spawn in a different place, or using a bed, or even a respawn anchor at this point, compasses will always point towards the center of the world, which is why when you use them in the nether, they traditionally go a little bit crazy. Now that we have lodestones in the game, you can attune them to compasses with a lodestone compass and then that compass will always point towards the location of the lodestone itself. Once again, this is only per dimension, so of course if you take this into the nether, it's going to go a little bit wild on you, but look at this. This compass is now pointing towards that lodestone at every opportunity, which means, potentially, we can use these for navigation. Once I take this lodestone out of the world though, you will see the compass starts to spin wildly. It is attuned to that lodestone which is now in my inventory, and if I place it back down, you'll notice the compass doesn't immediately start pointing to it, because the data of this lodestone block's position is not saved with the compass. Instead, we need to right-click on this lodestone again once it's placed, the compass locks to the lodestone, and now when I walk around, the compass is pointing directly to it. And I think this actually has some pretty exciting implications for gameplay. Say, for example, that I want a lodestone in a really central point in my world, like right here in the castle gateway. In fact, this is actually a really cool looking block, so I imagine using this as an accent block might work as well. But once I have attached this lodestone compass to the lodestone and it is locked onto that position, it's always going to be able to point my way home to this castle and to my nether portal, because basically anywhere I am in the world, I could follow this compass and it would take me home. Likewise, if you are on a multiplayer server or if you're crafting an adventure map and you want to point other players towards a specific location, whether it is your base, whether it is something completely different, a location of a temple or something that you want them to raid or even the next objective in an adventure map, you can find yourself hooking them up with these compasses which can be pre-attuned to lodestones and as long as the lodestone is not broken at any point the compass will remain pointing in that direction. Now for my next big question, and this is something I've not investigated before this episode, so we are about to discover this together. Can you push a lodestone using a piston? Sadly, you cannot. Okay, that's kind of a shame, because I was imagining these things flying off <laughs> attached to, um, attached to, like, flying machines or something like that, and the compass pointing the way to the flying machine the entire time. But no, it looks like you cannot end up firing this, and it's not some kind of bug with the piston. That should be activating the piston, and it is not. Oh well, looks like we can't attach these things to flying machines after all. Never mind. By the way, a pickaxe is now the ideal tool to break a piston, which is a very, very good change. I like that a lot. But let's say, for example, that I leave this lodestone in the floor here. It looks like a fairly ordinary block, and I can attune my compass to it, and now this compass is always going to point my way home. In fact, I might even rename this one Storage Building, like so. And now I know where that compass is pointing me at all times. You can even put this up in an item frame, and it will point in roughly the correct direction. Obviously, you can only display it in a 2D kind of way, so it's not really going to be able to show you all three axes at which direction you should go, but you can at least put these up in item frames to show you how to navigate to different areas. And with lodestones at those areas, the compasses will know which way to point. 
Not bad, right? And it feels really weird right now to have two compasses on my hotbar and having both of them pointing in different directions when I turn around. But of course, more than one compass can be attuned to the lodestone, and I don't think they will stack right now because they are renamed, but chances are you can create a whole stack of these, distribute them to your server mates, and all they will need to do is follow that particular lodestone compass to find where your base is. Okay, I've seen a lot of very cool things in my time, but a nether fortress intersecting with a basalt delta is possibly one of the coolest. I want to come back here and do something with this, and I think I will need- whoa, hello. <laughs> there you are, I knew you were shooting me from somewhere. I want to come back and do something with this because these are quite a rare find. Nether fortresses do not typically generate in basalt deltas or they don't start in basalt deltas. They spawn starting in nether wastes or soul sand valleys and they will only be able to intersect with these biomes if the world generation takes them out here. So I'm actually going to drop my other lodestone here. I was going to reserve it for that other huge bastion with the magma cube spawner that we found the other day but you know what? I think I'm going to take this here. I'm going to go back and rename this so that I can always find my way back here if I need to. And at this point, you're probably thinking, what are you doing, Pix? Just take the coordinates. And you're right. I think taking the coordinates is probably what I will continue to do because lodestones are kind of expensive to make and carrying the compass around in your inventory isn't the best thing in the world when you want to keep more inventory space free for loot and other things. But you know what? I think it's just kind of cool that this exists in the first place. It is certainly an alternative to using coordinates if you want that challenge. If you feel like Minecraft should have more ways to navigate around than turning on the F3 screen and having to deal with all of this extra data, it's certainly nice for folks who play on Bedrock Edition and don't want that stuff up in the top left corner as well. Some multiplayer servers even have the server configuration set so that the coordinate data is disabled, giving players a little bit more of a challenge for navigating around. And for servers like that, having lodestone compasses seems like a pretty cool thing. So now, when I want to head back to that nether fortress in the basalt delta, I will just grab this lodestone compass out of my ender chest and follow it to my destination. Now the last thing I want to look at today is another brand new Minecraft mob and it is the one that you can see occasionally if you look down into lava lakes. Unfortunately there is not any right here otherwise that would be <laughs> that would be too convenient wouldn't it Minecraft. But if I hoppity hop over here and come down to the shore of this warped forest you will see one of these guys hanging out over here in the lake. That right there is a strider. They are a brand new Minecraft mob and they survive in lava. Not only that, but they absolutely love living in lava and they will end up getting cold and shivery if they step out of lava for too long, which I'm going to try and convince this guy to do temporarily because I will hopefully be able to ride him. And difficult though it seems to get his attention a minute ago, it's actually not that difficult because all you need is some warped fungus. Warped fungus is the strider's favorite food. They love it. It is the food you need to breed them. And if you have a warped fungus in your hand, they will just happily wander over to check you out. And in this case, I'm just going to feed that guy because he's a good dude. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we cannot just right click on this guy and hop on his back. We actually need to saddle him up. And I'm not going to do that quite yet, but because before that, I will need something to control him a little bit. We will need a warped fungus on a stick, much like carrot on a stick in the overworld being used to control saddled pigs. You need a warped fungus on a stick to saddle up a strider. So let's see if I've got the goods for that in my ender chest here. I've certainly got the sticks, but unfortunately I don't have the string, so I'm going to head back to my piglin bartering hall and grab a little bit of string from them. Striders will also drop string if you kill them, which is kind of implied that their little, like, wispy hairs on the side of their heads are string, but I can't bring myself to kill these guys. They're just too adorable. <laughs> Luckily, the piglin bartering hall has got me covered, and I will grab three string out of here to craft myself a brand new fishing rod, and from there, we will turn that into a warped fungus on a stick. Actually, you only need two string. I lied. <laughs> there we go. We got ourselves a warped fungus on a stick. Let's head back and see if that strider friend is still there. He is. He's still there. Oh, hello, friend. All right, we will saddle you up. I'm going to hop on and oh, man, this feels dangerous now walking out over here and we're away. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. All right, so striders are a brand new form of transport here in Minecraft. We can take ourselves across the lava lake and despite the fact that they are merrily bobbing along the surface, this lava lake is potentially up to 10 or more blocks deep. I think it's maybe 10 to 12 blocks total and we are crossing it at quite a merry pace here. This is basically Mojang's answer to people asking for lava boats for years and years. What we have instead is lava creatures and these are really really quite fun to ride. 
you'll notice right now that the warped fungus on a stick is not decreasing in durability, much like when you ride a pig around in the overworld. The only time it decreases in durability is when you right click and you get the advancement. This boat has legs and it starts to go a little bit faster. You're basically G'ing up the strider. <laughs> the warped fungus on a stick has 100 durability and you only use one per hit, so every time you end up G'ing them up a little bit, it will carry them for quite a distance and they will really go. We are heading into uncharted territory here. And of course, I don't want to get off the strider right now. There we go. I think he's slowed back down to a normal walking pace. But I need to go faster than this. Ha <laughs> Hi-oh, Strider! Away! Now, you are potentially going to want to keep the Warped Fungus on a stick in your offhand for occasions like this, when you will need to look around with a bow to make sure there are no ghasts about to shoot you, because occasionally ghasts are going to take pot shots at you, and if they bullseye your Strider, that might be curtains for you if you're in the middle of a lava lake, especially if you're not wearing elytra. So be careful when you are riding these guys around, of course. Now, if I step back onto land with this guy, he is going to slow down and he is going to start shivering and turning this kind of purple color. And that is an indication that he is out of his element and he's going to walk a little bit slower as a result. Once you get them back into lava, though, they are right as rain and they enjoy being here in the lava, traveling at their maximum speed. <laughs> now, nothing bad is going to happen to your strider if you remove it from the lava environment. Of course, it's not going to just keel over and die here in the nether, and it's not even going to do that if you take them out to the overworld as well. They will adopt this kind of blue, shivery texture if you end up taking them out to the overworld, unless they are in lava in the overworld, of course. Now, let's see if we can climb up this lava fall here. I have a feeling, nope, that's not going to work out for us. Okay, well, it was worth a try, but I am very much on fire now. Even standing on top of magma blocks isn't warm enough for these guys. They do seem to like staying in the lava, and they will, in fact, be damaged by water. So if you end up bringing one to the overworld, beware. If it wanders into a puddle of water or it starts raining in the overworld, then chances are, much like a snow golem might, this thing is going to keel over and die. So we do need to make sure that we keep it in an environment that it likes. It's not going to get mad at you if it's not in lava, but you do end up feeling kind of sympathetic to them once they're standing on the shore and shivering and shaking like they want to get back in their nice warm bath. Dismounting a strider is as simple as getting close to the shore within a block's distance and then pressing left shift to dismount the same way you would with a minecart or a boat or something like that and i think we're going to reward this guy for a job well done here you go buddy thank you so much for allowing me to ride around on you for the day i think maybe we will see if we can breed one or two of these now, naturally, this isn't going to be everybody's ideal form of transport, and once I've got hold of Elytra, I don't expect to find myself riding around on striders all that much. But it is still not a bad way to traverse the nether for the first time, especially since all you really need is to find a warp forest and get yourself a fishing rod to control one of these and have it carry you across some of the more treacherous terrain the nether has to offer. We can also find ourselves a couple of warped fungus and maybe we'll end up breeding a couple of these guys. Because striders are passive mobs after all and passive mobs are typically the ones that you can breed. So let me uh, breed two of these together and they should produce a tiny adorable offspring somewhere in there at least <laughs> if I can maybe circle around a little bit and see it. There it is. Oh, look at that. <laughs> they come out from behind their parents. And the cool thing about these is that sometimes you will see striders stacking on top of each other. They will typically ride each other around as they get used to the lava environment. In fact, uh, nope, that one just has a block of netherrack behind it. I thought for a second that I saw one here. But you know what? This one here already has a saddle and I can hop from strider to strider just like that. Occasionally you will see these spawn with zombie pigmen riding on their backs and I think what may have been the case here is that the zombie pigmen got ridden into this glowstone block or one of the surrounding lower blocks and oh evasive maneuvers let's go to the to, to action let's fight this ghast attack the cavalry is here yeah, there we go. We took him down. All right. Well, as I was saying, it may be the case 
that the zombie pigmen ended up getting caught underneath one of the low hanging areas of the scenery here and took suffocation damage until it died because that's always the case with these mounted mobs you will occasionally find that you end up walking through some blocks. Thankfully, that doesn't seem to be the case as much with players. The striders will actually stop right there instead of walking under the blocks and suffocating you in them. So that is good news for anybody who wants to traverse some of these cavernous areas of the nether. But every now and then you are going to find a strider riding around with something else as its passenger, which is always kind of fun when you see it. But folks, I think that is where I'm going to leave you for today. I've had a lot of fun with these striders and I hope you guys will too. Check out that soul speed enchantment and try out lodestone compasses if you can get hold of a lodestone for yourself. I think it's a really, really interesting way to navigate the nether now. But for now, that's going to be it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Folks, don't forget to leave a like on the episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.